everybody see that and stuff? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Great. So thank you so much for having Jay and I here tonight. We're really happy to be here and happy to be part of this conversation. Um, I just do want to start by reminding everybody that we're talking about residential schools and that that can be a bit of a heavy topic. So really making sure that you're taking care of yourself during this conversation and afterwards. Um, I did also put the two crisis lines and support lines on there for anybody who might need them. Um, so I'm going to start off our conversation by going through some of the history of the Shinwalk Residential School. And then Jay's going to jump in and we're going to talk about the Children of Shinwalk Alumni Association and some of the work the Shinwalk Residential School Center are doing. So prior to the Shinwalk School opening, there were two mission schools in the Sault Ste. Marie region. And the mission schools operated similar to day schools. They were run by the Anglican Church of Canada. The first mission school opened in 1833, um, taught by a Anglican catechist, um, so someone who wasn't quite a deacon yet. Um, he, Reverend McMurray, was there for about 20 years. Um, and that building was in Sault Ste. Marie proper. By the 1870s, a second day school was opened and it was located on Garden River First Nation and it was known as St. John's Mission. Um, these two schools both were really emphasizing um, learning English and converting to uh, the Christian faith. Um, one of the things that was different about these schools from the Shinwalk Residential School was that the students were primarily from the local community and they would go for the day and then they would go home to their parents at the end of the day. The first uh, Shingwok Residential School opened in 1873 in Garden River First Nation. The first principal was Reverend D.F. Wilson. Um, the reason the sketch is so blurry is that's the only image we have of that residential school. Uh, that school was only there for six days um, and then it was burned completely to the ground. Uh, we've heard different things about that. Some people say that that fire was accidental. There's others from the community who said that that fire was intentionally set because the community did not want a residential school uh, there. As a result of the fire, um, the Shangwak Residential School moved to Sault Ste. Marie. So Garden River and Sault Ste. Marie aren't too far apart from each other. Um, few miles, uh, but far enough away from the community that it was in Sault Ste. Marie proper. The image that is on the screen kind of show you what the school looked like when it first opened. And I think it's really important to think about a couple of things when we think about the Shinwalk Residential School. It, when it opened in 1874 and throughout its duration, it had students come from all over to the school. So as far south as Sarnia, Walpole Island region, as far north as the James Bay Coast in Northern Quebec, as well as some students from Western Canada and the United States. So when we're talking about this history, though it's very tied to Sault Ste. Marie, it's also a history that really stretches throughout Canada and the United States. And we think about survivors and intergenerational survivors from Shinwalk, they're also all over located all across the land today. Um, when the Shingwak School first opened, it opened on a site that was about 90 acres. Um, if you can see the map on the screen, it shows you how big that site was. You see a lot of farmland, you see a lot of outbuildings, how the school system was set up. Students were in class for half a day and they were doing work around the school for half a day. Um, and that work tended to be very divided by gender. So the boys would primarily be working on the farm and things like the carpenter shop, the boot making shop, the sash and door factory that was on site. And the girls uh, primarily would be doing domestic work. So things like laundry, cleaning and cooking. So the Shinglock School, that first building, it was on the site until 1935. In, 19, in the 1930s, that original residential school building, it didn't have running water, it didn't have electricity, very poorly heated, poorly ventilated. 
Um, some of the stone of that original building was starting to crumble. The government decided it would be cheaper to build a new building than it would be to replace that original residential school building. And as a result, they built what was known as New Shenhua Hall. So that's the color image on the screen. Uh, so that building there, it opened in 1935 and operated as a residential school until 1970. Um, so total time on the site you have from 1874 until 1970. So almost a hundred years of a residential school in Sault Ste. Marie. And about a year after the residential school closed, that's when Algoma University moved onto the site, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about that legacy bit in a moment. Um, but I'll actually, I'm gonna pass it over to Jay to talk a little bit more about the residential school experience. Hi everybody, um, thanks for uh, joining us tonight. Um, this is my mother, Susie Kiknaswe Jones. Um, she was taken from her front yard. She was playing with her brother in the front yard at four and a half years of age. Um, they were standing at the fence and a car pulled up and two men got out of the car. One picked up my mom and one picked up her brother, put him in the car and drove away. And a couple of days later, she ended up at Shingwa Hall in Sault Ste. Marie. Mind you, she's from, she was on Wapo Island First Nation. So that's Southern Ontario, close to Detroit, Michigan. So imagine being four and a half, a stranger grabs you and takes you. And then you spend two days driving to a place you've never seen or never even knew about. And um, the elders say when they walk through the front door of Shingwa Hall, um, their life changed forever. So, and the original doors are still there in the hall. Um, she was truly assimilated and that I believe that's, that was the ultimate goal of, of the church. Um, however, they did it and however they went about it, she knew that she had to do certain things in order to survive. And when she tells her, she used to tell her story, um, it was pure survival instinct. So she knew if she did what they were asked to do or told to do, she would do it and she would do it like you see here with a smile on her face. So it's it's kind of weird seeing my mother at such a young age and um, knowing what they all went through and she still was able to smile. So I just, I just love this picture. Um, I didn't even know it existed until about two months ago. And it's been become my favorite picture of her at, at the Shingwak Residential School. So, and I'm considered an intergenerational. Me and my siblings are intergenerational. So that's a whole nother gamut. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the history around Chief Shingwak. So if we think about the Shingwak Residential School, it actually has a somewhat unusual name most residential schools were named after the place they were located or um, a religious figure. So there's dozens of St. Mary's residential schools, for example. Um, but the Shingwak Residential School was named after Chief Shingwak Owens. The first principal of the residential school had a relationship with the Shingwak family. Um, and Chief Shingwak had a vision of something called teaching wigwams. Uh, this was this idea of and Anishinaabe people learning alongside European people and European people learning from Anishinaabe people. So really a cross-cultural exchange of ideas, a sharing of knowledge, uh, working alongside each other uh, for a better community and for a better world together. Um, Chief Shingwak's vision was definitely lost through the residential school system. The Shingwak residential school became like residential schools all across Canada, really aiming to get rid of the language, culture, and identity of Indigenous children. Um, but it really, his vision um, has never gone away. His vision has still been held by uh, his descendants. It's work that's ongoing through the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association, through Algoma University, through uh, the Shingwak Education Trust, and Shingwak Kingamuk Agamig, an Indigenous university on campus. Um, and so it's 
a work in progress. And I think it's really important to go back to that original vision to talk about the potential of the site as a place of healing, a place of sharing, and a place of learning for everybody. Um, so one kind of key figure here is Dan Pine. Uh, so Dan Pine uh, was the grandson of Chief Shingwa Gongs. And he was really one of the first people who called for survivors to come together. He really said that it was the survivors who were going to know what to do. Um, he said, bring the people together, let them gather, and they will know what to do. He really believed that Chief Shingwak's vision was alive and well, and that the Shingwak site could be returned to community and be used uh, to help heal community. So Dan Pine and others really led to the first Shingwak reunion in 1981. Um, if we Think back to when I mentioned that Algoma University moved onto the site in 1971. You had a talk to somebody at Algoma in the 1970s and said, this is a really old building. What was it? Nobody would have said it was a residential school. Part of it was that conversation just wasn't happening in the 70s nationally. Um, but also there was a lot of intentional forgetting about that history. Um, it wasn't until survivors came together in 1981 that the importance of this history really came to the forefront. And I think one of the things that kind of speaks to that is when they were thinking about planning for the first Shingwak reunion, they weren't sure how many people would show up. They thought maybe 50 people would show up. There was over 300 people who showed up for that first reunion. There really was a desire of survivors and family members to come back to the site begin to talk about what happened. Um, really significant that this is happening in the 80s too. There's still residential schools open in the 80s. There's not a lot of national conversation going on in the 1980s. Uh, so the children of Shinglock are really leading uh, the way nationally as early as 1981. Jay, I'll turn it over to you if you wanna talk a little bit more. Yeah, one of my favorite things, I, I started going to reunions in 1996. Um, uh, I went up there with my mom and dad and three of my sisters. And when I went up there, I went up there to, to really learn about what the Indian residential school experience was like, because our parents didn't talk about it. We didn't even know if they went to Indian residential school until, until after this happened. So most of my life, I, or half my life, I guess I'm older than I think I am. Half, half my life, I didn't know my parents went to an Indian residential school. So when you see this picture right here and you see multiple um, reunions afterwards and gatherings, and you think about all these people coming together, just like Krista said a minute ago, you wouldn't think these people would wanna come together where such horrible things happened. But when they did come together, they turned it into a positive. They turned it into a healing type environment. And when you're around these people, they, there's just so much laughter. Um, of course, there's sad times and there's there's some reminiscing of some sad times, but they're easy to laugh. And it's just a wonderful, positive place to be around, even though so many bad things had happened there. Um, I can look in this picture and I can see my dad. And um, I remember him. Um, never ever talking about his Indian residential school um, experience. You could ask him questions and then he would answer, but he never would sit down with you and just start talking. So I also have um, an uncle, my, my mom's brother. Um, he was there, well, I have my mom's two brothers that went, that went there and my dad's brother that went there. So, um, and then on my father's side, there's, four generations of residential school survivors. And on my mom's side, there's two. But my uncle, Leonard, who that's my namesake, he um, was kind of a gypsy. He had this van and he would go to certain places and find a job and live there for a while. And he ended up in Colorado. And one of the reunions, um, he drove all the way back 
to Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario from Colorado to attend the reunion. And there's a circle drive right in front of where you see all these people standing. There's a circle drive. And he comes around the circle drive. He stops right in front of this door and he looks up at the door and he says, I can't do it. And he drove all the way, all the way back to Colorado. So he drove that far just to come to this reunion. And he had so much things going on inside him that he wasn't able to go through them doors. So it took him a while to, to, to accept it and to deal with it. And then I remember one reunion, um, me and my sisters were pressed into service. Um, some of the volunteers didn't show up, so they needed someone to run the registration table. And I love telling the story because it's one of my most favorite um, things of my uncle, of memories of my uncle. And we were so surprised that he walked in and he said, let the healing begin. And he was joking, but he was very serious too. And um, we knew right then that he had dealt with a lot of, of, of bad things inside his heart and inside his mind for him to step through that door and do that. So the healing journey is a long one. And his healing journey probably started, probably kind of started that day when he walked in through those doors. And he, he had a life of alcoholism and he, after that, he, his life turned around. He, it, it was amazing to see how um, he transformed into a more caring soul and understanding soul. So the, that building holds a lot of memories. And my mom used to say um, the, the child spirit. So many people lost their child spirit there. And if you haven't heard the story, I'm gonna make it as brief as possible. How this all started was um, Don Jackson was a, a, a professor there and he heard he was working late one night and his office door was open and he heard laughter, children's laughter. So he gets up off his desk, looks down the hallway both ways, doesn't see any children. So he goes back and sits down and continues working. A few moments later, he, heals, he hears more laughter. So he gets up, walks down the hall that way, walks down the hall that way. He doesn't see anything. He's the only one in the building. So he goes back to work. A few moments later, he hears it again. So he goes multiple floors of the building and he doesn't, he doesn't find anybody. So he, he wonders what it was. And that's when he went to Dan Pine, the picture you just seen before. Um, he went to Dan Pine and he asked, or he started doing a little research and he found out it was a former Indian residential school. So he grabbed it and he just went with it. And it, um, Dan Pine, Don Jackson, these are instrumental people that, that made this all happen. And now it's the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association was formed from that, was formed from this group that you see on the screen. And they've been doing grassroots work for over 40 years. And they're just a phenomenal, phenomenal group of people. And one of them's on this panel right now, Irene. So she's 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 a rock star too. So there you go. So when Jay mentioned Don Jackson, Don Jackson started something called the Shingwak Project. The Shingwak Project eventually uh, shifted into what today is known as the Shingwak Residential School Center. So one of the things that happened at that first reunion is some people wanted their experiences recorded. So on video, on audio, other people showed up with a handful of documents or a handful of photographs from residential school. And they wanted a way to be able to share this information with each other uh, and also to make sure that what was being talked about and when residential schools were being talked about that it was from the survivor perspective. Again, we're thinking about the 1980s. Most of the narratives around residential schools are by the government and by the church organizations in the 80s. Um, and so the Shingwak project was really started as a grassroots community-based archive, just as a way to share information between survivors. It was initially focused just on the Shingwak residential school, um, but it's really expanded since that point to collects information related to residential schools all across Canada. It's the longest running community-based archive dedicated to residential schools in the country. Part of its collections have been recognized by UNESCO as having national and international significance. Um, a really important um, 
archive for making sure that the history of residential schools is told by survivors and also that this history isn't forgotten and that it's something that can be used to teach future generations about. I think that's one of the things that's pretty unique about how this archive works. It's very much not, when you think of archive, you might think of like Library and Archives Canada um, or other large archives and your experience there versus coming to the Shangwak Residential School Center are very different. Uh, for example, even just the comfy seats in the center here, it's designed to be a welcoming space, a place where families and uh, communities can come together. We often get folks in non-COVID times uh, showing up and just saying, I heard you have photographs. Can I come in? Can I sit down and look at them? Um, and being able to find photos and documents connected to either their own or a family member's um, time at residential school can be a really powerful thing, can be part of a, a healing journey and start conversations um, with families. Actually, one of my favorite kind of examples of this is uh, there was a whole family in the center and they were looking through photos and the daughter suddenly said, mom, you told me you had never smoked in your life and then pointed out a photo and her mom had a cigarette hanging out of her mouth. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of a funny story, but um, it can start conversation. And I think that's one of the things that's really important because as Jay mentioned, there's a lot of people who even if their parents went to residential school, maybe they weren't talking about that. And so being able to look at those photos can be a way to start those conversations. Jay, do you wanna take this? Oh, you're muted. You're muted, Jay. If you wanna start out, go ahead, cause you know more about it. You're more involved in and then I'll add my okay. two cents. <laughs> sure. Um, so as I was kind of mentioning, the Shangwak Residential School Center is a nationally recognized community archive, but it's really a space that tries to teach about residential schools. Um, so for example, in 2018, the Reclaiming Shangwak Hall exhibition opened. It is an award-winning, one-of-a-kind exhibition that was driven by survivors, by the Children of Shangwak Alumni Association, uh, really to make sure that the history of the Shangwak site is in the building that was Shangwak Hall. The front doors to the school are actually the ones you see uh, on this slide here, the one that Jay mentioned, when people walked through their lives changed forever. Um, now, when you walk through those doors, you're confronted with the history of the residential school. Um, it's, you can't come to Algoma University, you can't come to the site without acknowledging the history, um, which I think is really important. Um, it's a big change from how things were in the 70s. Um, the Shangwak Residential School Center really works with everybody from elementary school children all the way up to university and professional development groups to help teach about this history, um, really making sure that there's an ongoing commitment to people learning about the history of residential schools in Canada and specifically about the Shingwak Residential School as well. Jay, if you wanna hop in. Yeah, so this exhibition is um, just like Krista said, it's one of a kind. And for it to be in the actual Indian residential school, um, I just, it's just phenomenal because just like she said, you can't be there without knowing what it is. And the history really runs deep. I mean, it's the whole history of, of the Shingwak school all on these walls. And um, it's um, just the design for the third stage of it is um, just starting now, or it's in process right now. But what's cool is um, there's this, the active survivors of um, the Children of Shingwalk Alumni Association, their portrait on there, their family's portrait on the walls. There's interactive. Yep, there's my favorite peeps right there. So I'm going to tell you who they all are. So if, in the left picture, left to right, it's Krista and then the former um, 
um, Shingwalk Residential School Center director, Liz. And then there's an elder, Shirley. She's very active. And then there's Jackie. She's very active. And then there's me. And then there's Shirley Roach. And then there's Ozma. Um, she's the Algoma University president. And there's my mom, who's no longer with us. She's my superhero. She taught me a lot of stuff and without her, I don't know where I'd be, so. And then the next picture, um, there's Roy, um, Marjorie. Marjorie's a survivor of Shingwalk Residential School. There's me again, my mom. And then there's Irene. She's a residential school survivor of Shingwalk and Shirley Horn and then Daisy. So this right here, these this two groups are the, the active part of um, Children of Shingwalk. And they've been doing it for over 40 years. And I've only been doing it for eight, but sometimes it does feel like 40 years. But um, <laughs> I'm just joking, of course. But um, it's just a wonderful group of people. And you can see a part of the, um, of the display behind them in the right picture. And then you can see Project of Heart um, display on the left picture. So there's all kinds of um, media there that you can access. And it tells the story. And I just, in all of these things that are on these walls, all these people had an active hand in helping the design. And we've had some really awesome designers that have worked with us and they, they are doing it properly. They ask us just about every little detail. They ask us what we think about it. So, and what's, what's weird is in Shingwa Call, um, spending so much time with the elders, I, I, I pick and choose who I walk with because every time you walk with one of the elders, you, you hear a different story. And sometimes it's, it's not a good story, but other times it's, it's a really good story. It, it fills your heart. So it's, it's such a joy to work with these elders. And um, I just think learning from them and, and just knowing what they went through as children and what, what they are today and who they are today and how happy they are. And, and when we're together, we just laughed the whole time in our meetings. And just to see that and what they went through as a children, as children, it just, it makes you think that there's always hope in this. And I noticed the tiles at the beginning of the presentation that's in your church. And I counted how many times people wrote hope. And it was five times that I counted. And I just thought that was cool because there is always hope. And these are living examples right here. I think that's actually a really good place for me to stop sharing our screen and then maybe we can uh, have a bit of dialogue and happy to answer questions um, about the residential school center. But I also know that Irene is here and that we had said that Irene could maybe chime in. So I think that would be a good time as well. Yes, for sure, uh, Krista. Uh, I'll just say, uh, echo Jay's words that you both have filled my heart so far um, in hearing what you've presented. And I'm, uh, so I now would like to turn to the, to again, what Jay, who Jay described as the rock star. So I know mm -hmm. Irene uh, Barbeau is waiting in the wings. Irene is a member of the All My Relations Circle here in the diocese and uh, uh, I believe a past president of the Children of Shinwak Alumni Association. And uh, as we know, she attended Shinwak as a, as a child. So Irene, can you unmute yourself and appear? Hello. Oh, there you are. Hi. 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 You want uh, to take a, a few minutes to tell us what you, whatever you'd like. The floor okay. is yours. Well, first of all, I will say to Krista and Jay, good job, guys. I'm proud of you. You did a good job. You always do. Uh, at this time, um, I am also the current vice president of, of the alumni. So I talk to um, Jay a lot when it comes to our meetings uh, uh, as well. One of the things I always feel so close to Jay because his mother, was uh, also a president or a vice president. Between the two of us, I think we served the longest terms of presidents and vice presidents. 
So I got to know his mom really well because she was there before me. And now what's so neat for me is, I don't know about Jay though, is that I, now I'm working with her son. And uh, it's a lot of fun. We laugh a lot with him and his which is mom Susie and I used to do. We'd have such fun talking about things. Uh, and uh, she'd call me for an opinion. I'd call her and vice versa. It was always a, a something that we discussed. It wasn't something one did alone. It was a group idea of things to do. And um, over the years, I was the first pre of president of the alumni. And uh, we did so much work in 1981 when we first came. It was a real nice reunion because we just socialized and had good times. And uh, then before the students went home, they said, oh, can we have another reunion? Unfortunately, the reunion didn't happen until 10 years later in 1991. And at that time, that's when all the ugliness of the residential school came out and all these horrible stories and how bad it was. And uh, as, as, a, as a survivor, I didn't know what was going around me because devious people do things in a devious way that nobody knows. They do it in seclusion and in a quiet way. So I could have been sleeping next two door, two beds down from somebody that was being abused and I would never have heard a thing. And also, if I did hear it and I tried to tell somebody, they would have thought I must have lost my mind because nobody would ever believe me if you told a survivor, so-and-so left it with a girl and then come back for a long time. What were they doing together? They thought I was nuts. They just push it under the rug and never deal with it. So, And that's one of the reasons people say, well, why didn't you tell a person? Well, you could tell a person they would never believe you in a million years. Now the truth is coming out. So there's the, uh, the opportunity for the survivors to tell their true story. And people, especially among the churches, really have to believe everything you hear that comes out of a survivor. Because nobody can make up these stories. They live the life they talk about. So, and I've had people in the beginning, especially at the church that I went to in the 70s, say, well, we had boarding schools. Uh, that's equivalent. I said, no, there's not another system that you can pair it with because when you had your boarding schools, your children went there and they came home. They weren't abused. They didn't, the, the school didn't try to change who they were. Because in the residential school, the sole purpose of, of the, uh, under the surmise of the churches was to take the Indian out of the child and tell the child that you're not Indian anymore. Now you have to come and live our style. So that's the difference. They tried to change you what God made you to be. And that can't be never, never forgotten. And that's why I... I've been working at this for 40 years in different capacities, and I'm still doing it today. And I think I'll probably, I told Jay, he might have to push my wheelchair if he needs something from me. <laughs> it might come to that because there's longevity on my side of the family. <laughs> so so I, I, I support the whole process and I'm so happy, Debbie, the first time she talked about uh, in Shinwak Residential School and my eyes popped up and I said, oh, that's the school I went to. And my family was all there at that time with me, my children and my grandchildren. And we had such a good discuss discussion. They saw, they spoke, the, the people that were there heard from my children and my grandchildren, which was kind of neat. And then, when Debbie told me about this and she said, oh, we're going to have Jay and Krista come and do a presentation. I said, oh, my goodness, I know those people. So and that's the reason why I joined. I, I, and then I'll stop talking in a minute because Jay told me, don't steal the show. <laughs> so all good things are happening. 
one thing I'll leave you with is the, 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 those ladies you saw in those pictures, two pictures, one of the um, commitments we made to ourselves as a group is that we would make something good come out of this horrible thing we experience as young children. And we're still doing it. So I'm hoping that we're a good example to the rest of Canadians that there is hope at the end of the road. Miigwech. Thank you, Irene. Thank you so much. Uh, it is a pleasure to work with you. I just, I love your sense of humor too. Um, and we, um, Irene and her family participated at uh, Church of the Ascension when we did the, the tiles uh, and the project of heart. And that, that really was a, a very positive experience uh, of learning uh, within our parish. So um, I would like to now um, turn to question and answer. I think uh, all three speakers are willing to entertain uh, questions. And um, so please put them in the chat box. You could send them to me um, uh, directly if you want, Debbie Grisdale, or to um, just everybody. And um, uh, we'll deal with the questions as they come along. Uh, so <clears throat> we have a few that have come through already. Um, uh, so Krista or Jay, can you tell us a bit more about Chief Shinwak? A bit more history about him. Jay, do you want to, or do you want me to? You can. Okay. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that second question. Okay. Um, yeah. So Chief Shengwak was uh, Chief Shengwak Ons. Um, Shengwak actually means little pine in, um, or Shengwak Ons means little pine in Anishinaabe Um So when you see a pine tree, it's a Shengwak tree. Um, but uh, he was a chief of Garden River First Nation, uh, really a political leader, a, a warrior, um, a spiritual leader as well in his community. He fought in the War of 1812. He was the signatory of the Robinson-Huron Treaty, uh, one of the signatories of the Robinson-Huron Treaty in 1850. Um, I'd say probably his one of his most lasting um, impacts is that vision around teaching wigwams and that idea of cross-cultural education. Um, that and his extended family, about half of Garden River is connected to the Shingwak family in one way or another. Um, it's a very large family and community. Um, but it, him and subsequently his sons, Augustine and Buckle Shindini, um, worked closely with the Anglican Church, uh, particularly the first um, principal of the residential school, Reverend D.F. Wilson. Uh, they were constantly petitioning for a teacher at Garden River First Nation. They were petitioning to have a school built in Garden River. Um, and that's really how you see the early relationship between Shingwak and the Anglican Church developing. And that's how you see the school being named after uh, Chief Shingwak. Um, though, like I said, that kind of did get lost through the residential school period, but I think it's important to remember that early relationship and then the family afterwards who really brought that vision back to life. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, why was this school so different from other residential schools that have such a terrible reputation? Um, I'm going to just say a few words and then I'd like Irene to answer that too. Um, first-hand knowledge, but um, from some of the stories I heard, um, Shinwalk Residential School was has its own stories also. Um, one I know for a fact is um, my mom's brother who was off in the um, bush near Shinwalk Hall and he had some abdominal pain. So he came back into the school and um, they treated him not as well as they should have. He should have went to the hospital, but he didn't go to the hospital. So they got his other brother, Leonard, uh, my mom's other brother, Leonard, and they made Leonard stand there and they threatened Leonard and said, if you don't behave or if, if you run away, this is what's gonna happen to you. So there are horrible stories at Shingwak. And I believe there's probably horrible stories at every residential school. So um, I think 
why it's such a good story now is the initiative that people like Irene and my mom and the elders and Don Jackson and Dan Pine, the initiative that they took to continue Shingwalk's vision. And if you stop and think about it, Shingwalk's vision was just way ahead of its time. So I, I gotta believe that man's just a genius. So I just, it's a, it's a wonderful idea and it's an idea that's stood the test of time and that's what the CSAA does. So Irene, if, is there anything you'd wanna add? Uh, no, but yeah. I'll answer number three. <laughs> Since I was okay. there. <laughs> I came to Sault Ste. Marie from another residential school in Moose Factory, Ontario. It was called Horton Hall. And uh, I started going to Horton Hall back in 1954. I was nine years old with my sister, Virginia, who's next to me, who was seven at the time. And in order for me to uh, uh, go to high school, uh, I was shipped to Sault Ste. Marie for high school and to finish off my, my grade eight in the Sioux. I went to Anna McRae Public School, which is just across the uh, back, at the back of the school. At the time I was there, they didn't have any classrooms in the building itself, but in the 1930s and 40s, they did have classrooms. And uh, the teachers weren't that qualified that taught there. So like Jay said, um, uh, the kids, I think, uh, went to school half a day and did chores in the, af in the afternoon. But when I came along, I just boarded there. I went to grade eight to Anna McCray Public School. And, Anna and behind Anna McCray was Sir James Dunn was the high school. Those two buildings were built strictly for the uh, indigenous people at Chinook Hall. We were integrated into the city to join the other students from the city and transition us, I guess, into white society or practice how to be white or whatever you want to call it. And, and so that's what happened. And the other reason why they, Eventually what happened was I boarded for two years for grade 11 and 12 in a private home. And the people, uh, uh, I, I have to thank my parents. They had to say where I was gonna be placed in a private home. They insisted that I be placed with a Christian family that's gonna continue going to school so I could uh, go to high school and then still continue going to church. And that's what happened. The, my landlady, Florence Joy Clement, which is still, a, she's still alive today. She's 83. I still have contact with her. So she was very good to me. They had two little boys and I lived with another girl. They always called me the daughter they never had. So I had a very good relationship with them. And then, and the reason why we were boarded out, these were high school students that lived with private homes that were screened through Indian Affairs was that there was overcrowding at Shinwak because some more kids were coming from other communities, the younger children. So they had to make room for them. So they put us in private homes and I stayed with the, the Clement family for grade 11 and 12. And I started working in Sault Ste. Marie right after high school, but then I eventually moved back to Moose Factory, Ontario, and I got a full-time job at the, um, uh, with Tal Canada, that they ran that Indian, rest, uh, it's a tuberculosis facility. I worked there until, I went there in 63, and I worked there till 1969 when I was married there, and my husband and I both worked there and then we eventually moved away in 1972. So, and that's how, um, how they uh, provided the children so they can continue to go to high school if they wanted to, because in those days it was rare for native students to go to high school. The tendency was that I believe the policy in the province was you can quit school when you're 16. And a lot of the indigenous, uh, especially girls quit. They didn't come 
they didn't further uh, further their education. And because my father was also a survivor, he went to another school called St. John's in Saplo, Ontario. He was a, um, a clergy in the Anglican church and he was also a teacher. He taught Monday to Friday as a teacher, then a weekend he did his priestly uh, jobs and he knew that education was the way to go in order for his family to survive in this world and be good citizens and contribute to the country. There were six of us in my family. The first four went to residential school, the two youngest one uh, didn't have to go because my parents lived in a place that was that had a high school. So that that's the gist of how they ran the schools at that time. And I heard consequently that the things got better for the kids that came after I did when I left there in 62. Things improved because by that time, the running of the Shinwa call especially was returned to the um, federal government and they hired uh, not churches, not, not church people, they hired regular people. I call them regular people, like, you know, uh, and they were teachers, they were qualified to run the place. So things really changed after that. So there was some good, uh, uh, as the years came later, Times change and things were good. Even though the abuse was still happening, like we can't not forget that abuse took place at Chinua. And so we still have to keep that in our minds, even though there's good things coming out of that facility. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. So a few questions are coming in, which is great. Uh, thinking of the students who were at the school at the time of its closure, how was the closure managed for them? Were the children returned home or simply enrolled in day schools and other living arrangements uh, were, and other living arrangements made in Sault Ste. Marie? And what was the impact of this transition? So I think Irene spoke a little bit to, um, prior to Shane Watt closing, they started a boarding out process. So there were already some students that were in community. Um, also starting by the mid fifties, that's when you see the integration period happening at the Shingwak Residential School. So students are sleeping, eating, uh, sometimes working at the Shingwak School, but they were attending local elementary schools and high schools. Um, so you kind of see that happening all across Canada with residential schools being phased out. As to what happened to each individual student, we don't have a good sense of that, unfortunately. Um, it partially depended on where the student was from and how old they were as to where they would have maybe been sent or if they went home um, in the 1970s. Great. Thank you. Um, question about uh, how do the archival practices of the Shinwalk Residential School Center differ from Western archival practices? In what ways can we work toward a decolonized archive? Uh, Krista, they ask, how do you relate, reconcile your work with the Diocese of Algoma <clears throat> to your work at the center? This question's so up my alley. Thank you, Kate. Um, <laughs> Perfect. Uh, um, I'd say, um, first of all, I really want to acknowledge, like, I'm a white person working in the residential school center, and it has definitely been a learning curve. I remember when I was first hired in 2010, it was my second professional job. I thought I knew a lot of things. It was actually, I remember sitting down with Susie and quickly learning that I did not know things that I thought I knew shit in a very kind way. Um, but it was definitely uh, a lot of listening that had to take place um, in recognizing that how uh, community cares for archival records is very different than how maybe I was taught in university um, and that the way the center operates now is that we tend to be very collaborative in how we describe archives, how we care for records. Um, we're asking for help from the survivor community quite often. Um, so for example, when we're describing something and we're not sure if we're, we should make it accessible to the general public. We're always turning to the survivors for their opinion there. 
Um, and I think that's kind of the biggest piece around the decolonizing the archive is making sure that it's not just, you know, the traditional white archivists doing all of that work. Um, in terms of working with the Diocese of Algoma, I was working at the Shangwak Residential School Center when I became the diocesan archivist. But one of kind of the nice things is that the Diocese of Algoma has a really good working relationship with the Shangwak Residential School Center and with the Children of Shangwak Alumni Association. I don't know if you noticed in the first reunion picture, but at the front, there were a couple of uh, clergy members. Um, the diocese has been involved right from the beginning of the Shingwak reunions. Um, and one of the things that has kind of come through working with the diocesan archives is that because the Anglican Church ran the Shingwak residential school, uh, we've been able to access the diocesan archives and make those accessible to community, which I think is really important. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> what is the most important thing for today's children to know about residential schools? I want to take that one. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I always tell people that uh, the children were physically abused, sexually abused, spiritually abused. Um, but one of the biggest things is they didn't have any parental nurturing. And to me, when a child's growing up, that's what they thrive on. They, they thrive from the affirmation of their mom and dad. Um, they thrive from affirmation from their siblings, their older siblings. None of that took place. For generations, none of that took place. So could you imagine your child being taken and as a parent, as a survivor, yourself already, you already know what's gonna happen to them. What, what does that do to that parent? And do they give up? My, my mom's mom gave up her parental rights, so to speak. So there is no parental nurturing. And I believe that was one of the biggest things that has led to, to the just plain and, plain and simple the way that uh, uh, Anishinaabe are today, that... Um, um, that parental nurturing, the lack thereof is um, just so detrimental and did so much harm. So for others to know that, and I mean, how can you relate that to a child is say, can you imagine your mom not being there for your, um, you know, your fifth grade graduation or not there for your first t-ball game or not there for your first football game and not there in the stands cheering you on. I just can't, I mean, I did so many things with my son, him growing up. I, I don't think, I, I probably missed two of his events from the time he was born to the time he graduated high school. And I can't imagine not being there and being able to see all that with your child and being that child and not having your parent there. That to me, that was the biggest crime of all, one of the biggest crimes. Irene, do you have anything? Uh, that's exactly what happened to uh, to the children because what happens then if you were never hugged and told you were loved, you don't really know love because you're sort of raising your own self and what happens, and I did this myself, is you build a wall around you because you had to fend for yourself from a very young age. And sometimes that, that while you build it, yourself around is very difficult for people to to penetrate because you're so used to being in survivor mode that when people are nice to you or you think oh what are they trying to get from me you know and that's not normal because as as Jay said when you're growing up your teachers teach you those feelings teach you how to be kind and stuff like that. Love yourself. Love your uh, friends and, and things like that. None of that happened. We never celebrated Father's Day or Mother's Day. Never celebrated our birthdays. Those occasions were just another day for us. And the only two celebrations we had was Easter and Christmas and those 
of course, you know, their um, Christian celebrations. There was so much more, like, just that question alone probably would take about an hour if one was to answer in totality. So that's, that's just like a brief question. I mean, you went mute. Oh, I muted myself. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. So that, you know, there's so many parts of the residential school that you can devote a whole hour to with different panels of survivors. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, so the three of you have talked so positively about the work of the Alumni Association and the and the center. So one of the questions asked is how can how can people support it? What you know what support do you do you get from the public and how could interested public support the work? Jay, can you take that question? Not really. I just <laughs> <laughs> Then money. Uh, I, told, Chris, I told Chris, you. Well, <laughs> I well on a on a personal level level, CSAA is a grassroots operation. Um, we are all volunteers. Um, these elders, these survivors, have been volunteering their time for for forty years. So that's how the work gets done. And then we have superheroes like Krista. That that that's their job. They are on the site, they are doing all the hard work and labor to get things done and to make this a, a happening thing. So, I mean, we don't ask for money. We just say, if you can give, there's, there's, you can give monetarily. Um, if you can give time, I mean, there's, there's little pockets of this type of activity all over Canada. And um, I think just, finding out the local areas where you can give your time. You know, I tell people, and I've said this for um, probably half my life, is you can't buy time. You have to give time. So if you can give your time, that that sometimes that makes all the difference. So there's many ways to volunteer. There's ways to give money. So there's, there's things to do in, in that respect. So hopefully that answered that question. That's great. Thank you. And I see in the, in the chat that Krista has put uh, uh, a website for uh, giving through Algoma University uh, and also has um, uh, referenced some books geared to children to, to talk with them about residential school. So that's very helpful, thank you. <clears throat> um, back at the questions, there's uh, one or, or two about um, uh, Chief Shinwag's vision of um, the wigwam, teaching wigwam. And uh, could you explain a little bit more about what, what that is and how, how that is being uh, sort of uh, carried out today? Yeah, um, so it would be a learning place or a teaching place. Wigwam could be lodge is one example. Um, could also mean physical place or idea. Um, Today, that work, you really see it uh, through Algoma University and Shangwak Kinamo Gagamig, the Anishinaabe partner on campus, uh, as well as the Children of Shangwak Alumni Association. So for example, seeing cultures coming together on campus to learn from each other, that could be informally at like a Shangwak gathering. Uh, it could also be in the classroom. So Algoma University does have an Anishinaabe studies degree program, as well as an Anishinaabe Moan language degree program. Um, so seeing that exchange of culture. Um, and I think it can happen in lots of different ways. Algoma University today has about a 45% international student population. And so seeing cultures from all over the world coming together, not just Canadian and indigenous cultures, uh, but really thinking more broadly than that and learning beside each other. Jay and Irene, if you wanna jump in, go for it. I'd like to address the question from Heather Swall about oh. the uh, okay. what the Roman Catholic Church is saying that records from these are not available. Um, there's a big difference between uh, the uh, way that the Roman Catholic Church is viewed as opposed to the other faith, like the Anglican Church, the United Church and the Presbyterian. Um, 
as you know, the Pope never apologized to uh, the students. And I don't think I'll live the day when a Pope apologizes, which says great things about that institution. And um, because even right from the get-go, the uh, Roman Catholic Church never bought into the, uh, the idea of contributing something towards the healing of the damage they did to Indigenous people. Because uh, I think their view is if we um, contribute, that's an admission that we did wrong. And they want, I don't think they want to be seen as doing something harmful to anybody. But in fact, they were the worst ones of all the residential school because I've spoken over the years to a lot of survivors that went there. Oh my goodness, the stories that come out of that place is just unbelievable. The, what they what happened in those um, in those uh, Catholic run churches. A uh, prime example is Kamloops. And there's probably more stories about that in terms of uh, the other churches. But at this moment, the Catholic church run ones are the worst ones. And, and the survivors that went there were the most bitter I've ever met because they cannot forgive the church what they did to them. See, in a local place, like on a reserve, at around the 50s and 60s, the priest, the local priest had every run of a, a, an indigenous person's life. My friend told me that when you worked and I had a full-time job, you didn't get your paycheck. It went to the priest and he, he kept it for you because there was no bank there. And you'd have to go to the priest every time you want to buy something. And, and you had to tell him what you're going to buy. Like, how ridiculous is that? That's how much hold the Catholic Church uh, had the people on the west coast of James Bay. And that's where my, my friend lived. I never, like, where I grew up on the other, on the east coast of James Bay, I never had that happen. They were there, but they had no parishioners. They were always there. So I never heard of a person had that much control of indigenous people as a whole. And the um, the premise in those days was the the, the clergy and the, the people of cloth are like you got to trust them. Whatever they say is the word. But now we know it's not, you know, right. because otherwise we wouldn't be in the situation we're in. Yeah, yeah. So so that leads to a to a question uh, um, with the news coming out of Kamloops of the unmarked graves there what will there be do you anticipate a similar search in the area around Shinwalk school and who makes that decision and and how how might that happen um I've heard stories um firsthand stories um of former residential school survivors witnessing and being part of digging a grave site and putting children, their fellow students into these grave sites. Um, one came forward just since Kamloops, he came forward and he's from my home reserve, the Wapo Island. And he tells his story. Now um, I was corresponding with his wife and um, his wife says he's told this story for his whole life. And she goes, it's never varied one bit. And he was probably about four and a half, five years old, he said, and he was brought out to a grave site behind Shingwak. And um, he said between the chicken coop and the hall. So, and he witnessed the burial. So I don't know why the, whoever, if it was the principal, whoever it was that brought him out there, I don't know why they would bring him out there. Maybe they thought he was too young and he wouldn't understand and he wouldn't remember it anyways. And that's how they said it. That's how they told the story to me. But he did remember it. So the, the, there is at least one case at Shingwalk, and I'm sure there's more. But we've already, um, since Kamloops happened, right away, um, we got the CSA elder survivors got together and we had a meeting and we got together with Algoma University 
and as because they they are on the majority of the site that would be searched. So I can say presently we have a committee forming. We are working out the details to actually search um, the grounds of the Shingwalk site. So um, I believe this will be happening um, on a lot of Indian residential school sites, former sites, and and it's a sad it's a sad thing, but it's something that has to be done because it is part of the truth. And I keep saying that you have to know the truth to, in order to reconcile. So, yeah. Then Shinwak was a Anglican run school. Do you get cooperation from the diocese on, on this, the diocese of Algoma? Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, um, they called me right away or fairly quickly, I should say, and um, we had conversations. So um, they um, want to be represented on part of the committee. Um, they want to be an active role. Um, they are all aboard as far as doing this the proper way. So, and when I say proper way, the traditional way, um, much care will be taken in how we do this, um, how we notify the families. I mean, it, there's just so much involved. It, uh, it's such a great, mag um, the magnitude of this, just one school, one operation, one search is just phenomenal. And to have this done throughout Canada at multiple locations, I just think it's 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 going to be a time of um, of deep sorrow. But I believe, um, as children of Shingwak have always done, I believe there's going to be much good that comes from it, and these families will be able to put some feelings to rest. Um, these these brothers and sisters will may find out um, where their brother or sister went. I mean, the, it's just these type of things that will come from that, that will um, um, hopefully mend some, mend some pain. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. Just add for context, uh, Shingwak does actually have a formal cemetery on its site. Um, so that's in addition to any unmarked burials, but we know there are at least 72 children buried on the Shingwalk site. Okay. Thank you, Krista. Uh, I, I just wanna add to uh, Jay and uh, Krista's uh, comments. And we know that, the, that there are no 70, was it 72 uh, bodies that are not all marked? The ones that are marked are mostly the staff that that passed away there over the years, and if it's seventy two, well, the uh, graveyard is going to expand exponentially. And the other thing was that Jay didn't mention because I think he was too humble <laughs> that he's the lead on the uh, uh, searching for unmarked graves. He was asked to lead it, and he won't be alone leading it. We have a uh, multiple groups of um, professional people from the non-indigenous committee, and we've had that. We already, I think, have a team in place that have come forward to help with it. They're down in London, Ontario, and they're willing to come up and do the search because we have to remember. The site of Shinwak is uh, now Agoma University is a hundred acres. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of um, uh, uh, work to be done, but it's going to be a, a long process, going to be a, a respectful process. And one of the things I, uh, I had suggested was that both the native spirituality and Christian a faith be part of the process. Mm -hmm. Because I know for a fact that a lot of survivors are Christians and remain Christians. These are Anglicans I'm talking about because I'm an Anglican. So uh, I think it's uh, to be inclusive, that has to happen. Thank you. Thank you, the three of you for being so, so honest with us. And I have to say, I can just feel how well you work together with the superhero, the rock star and the humble leader. It's a, it's a, a wonderful combination of, of um, caring between the three of you. Um, so I, 
the uh, final question, I think, uh, sort of um, perhaps kind of uh, circling back to where we're where where we're going, not where we started, but where we're going is um, about truth and reconciliation. And, uh, you know, this this um, so much of this conversation started thanks to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And and I think many of us have uh, woke up um, because of that commission's work and the calls to action. So just uh, observations by uh, any of you about where you think we are at in terms of the truth and reconciliation process, truth telling and the reconciliation process. I see them waiting, so I'll say something. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I think the truth and reconciliation um, was a good thing. Um, it just as just as you said, it opened up a lot of eyes. Um, I've heard some that are like in the trenches, so to speak, and they say there's there's still a lot that needs to be done. Um, they are they're afraid that it's just going to go away and it's going to be yesterday's news. But um, what's very unique is um, we had a meet right after Kamloops. We had a meeting in um, Algoma University and the elders, and they they um, kind of crafted a statement that they were going to give out to everybody. And one of the things that they said is the children in Kamloops revealed themselves for a reason. And that reason to me personally is that there's still a lot of work to be done. And that's what they, that's in the letter, that's what they crafted. There's still a lot of work to be done. So it's people like you that have, have joined here today that, that um, are being educated. So um, I'm gonna do something my mom always did is challenge you guys and um, to spread that word, to, to, tell, to tell somebody that doesn't know and educate them. And the more people that know about this, the more education, then I believe this will start the healing process for both sides. Um, the, no, the knowledge is power. I've been saying this for a while now, knowledge is power. And the more you know, the more you can understand um, someone else's life story. What happened to them helps you understand why they are this way. We're all taught differently throughout our lives. We, we have a different upbringing. So what you believe and what I believe might be a little bit different, but we still should respect that. And I think once we learn that respect, once we learn that history, then we have an understanding. And once we have that understanding, then I believe we can move forward in a positive way. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. So I, I think we'll draw the question and answer period to a close. And uh, so I'll turn it over to, to Diana to, to thank our speakers for being with us this evening. Oh, I am, feel so privileged tonight. We want to thank you, Krista, Jay, and Irene for sharing the history of Shinwa, for sharing your personal stories which bring this history to life and have touched us deeply. Thank you for telling us the possibility of healing in this story of the resilience and strength of the former students of Shinwa and their families and their community. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to learn. And thank you for challenge, challenging us to educate others. Miigwech, everyone. Thank you. I think we have a, a closing prayer. God, our creator, who is loving and always with us, we pray for strength and humility to walk in balance within your created order. We pray for our understanding of one another so that the wounds of this broken world may be made whole. We pray that promises made and broken be, can be honored and mended. 
We pray these words so that we may have healing within our communities. And from that gift of healing, the spirit to serve you in harmony and peace. And in the end, we may taste the sweetness of heaven come down to earth so that we may all find everlasting rest in your embrace. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. So thank you all for, for joining us and uh, safe home to all of you. And uh, don't forget the challenge from Jay and Krista and Irene to about truth telling and sharing that truth with others. Thank you all. Good night.